Hello everyone and welcome back. Now in the previous lecture, we started our unit on dynamical systems. Now, it was sort of a false start in the sense that we didn't talk about any dynamics, nothing changed in time. We talked about steady states to dynamical systems. So what we'll do in this lecture is introduce ourselves to understanding dynamical systems. And we are going to focus ourselves on very simple one-dimensional problems. So just like our falling goggles model. In the next lecture, we'll start talking about two-dimensional problems, and you'll see how the complexity steps up from there. Now, what I would like to do is start by really drilling down on what it means to be a dynamical system. Now, a dynamical system is going to be a differential equation, okay? So you can have a state variable x, and you say that its derivative is equal to a function of x. Now in this lecture, x is going to be considered a uh, one-dimensional or a scalar variable. So this thing would have a solution, x of t, so it's a function of time, even though I didn't write it explicitly, with typically you have to be given an initial condition. So I'll call this x naught. So remember, we saw where these initial conditions come in with the falling goggles example, right? I said that my initial velocity is zero because it fell off my lap. And I use that initial condition to solve the differential equation and find that constant of integration. You can keep this in the back of your mind, but essentially what we are going to look at is equations that look like this, and we can ask ourselves, if we know where we start, where will we go? Now, what distinguishes dynamical systems from typical differential equation analysis is its unification with geometry. It intends to really understand the movement of these solutions. You can think of this as sort of a particle flowing through time. And you can ask yourself, where will it go to? Typically, in an ordinary differential equations class, you're more interested in saying, what is the solution? Now, with dynamical systems, we can't always write down what the solutions are, but we can still feel around how things behave using that unification with geometry. Okay, so how do we do this? Well, the first thing we do is we remind ourselves that when we try to analyze a dynamical system, it typically starts in this way. We start by solving for the steady states. Now remember, the steady states are where you don't change in time, which means you are setting the left-hand side of this differential equation equal to zero, which means you're trying to find the roots of a function. So you can see Newton might be helpful for you again. right? It's, Newton's method is not just useful for optimization problems. In this case, finding steady states is a root-finding problem again. But we can go further than steady states. In fact, what we could do is we could find movement of the particle as well. So for example, we know that the derivative, if it's equal to f of x, if this thing, say, is positive, so if f of x at some point is positive, this implies that dx of t is positive which implies x is increasing, right? This is our understanding of a derivative that we learn in a basic calculus class. Same thing if this thing is negative, this would tell me that my derivative is decreasing, or sorry, my, decre my derivative is negative, which tells me x is decreasing. And then I can unify this with a geometric perspective, okay? So I can think of all of the possible values of x existing on a line. I am hiding the time dynamics behind this thing, okay? Now, because my function f is a one-dimensional function, I could sketch it out. So let me do that down here. Let's imagine f looks like this. Okay, so I just scribbled up, you know, the, the first little scribble line that came to my head. 
Now, using that picture, I can fully understand how X moves through what's called a phase line diagram. Now, what I want you to see is F has three roots. I don't know what they are. Maybe I had to use Newton to find them. Maybe I used Desmos to plot them. But those three roots are steady states. So what I can do is I can denote them on my phase line diagram by dots. These are the steady states or the equilibria of my solution or of my differential equation. Now, what I can also see is that when x is negative, or sorry, when uh, f is negative right here, then x is decreasing. On a number line, that means moving to the left, which I could indicate with these little arrows. Those arrows tell me where the solution will be going. It tells me I'm moving to the left if I am to the left of this equilibrium. Same thing, in between these two equilibria, I am positive. It means I'm moving to the right. I'm increasing my value of x. In between these two equilibria, I'm negative. I am moving to the left. And finally, outside of those equilibria, I am moving to the right. This right here is all that I need to understand my differential equation, if that's what my f looks like. All of the information I care about is on this line right here. This is what's called a phase line diagram. Notice there is no time anywhere on it. Time is indicated by arrows. So what, what can I, if, if I gave you this, what could I read about my differential equation? I'd say one, two, three steady states. Okay, that's the location of them. Now, what that means here is that if I start at a steady state, I stay at the steady state. I never change in time. Okay, what happens if I start in between? Imagine I've got a point right here. That's where I started at x0. What do I do? Well, I go with the flow. The flow tells me I'm going left, and I'm going left, and I'm going left, and I keep going until as t goes to infinity, I hit this equilibrium. I'm converging. Okay, so what this says, it says go left until you can't go left anymore. So if I started right here with x naught, right? So if x of zero is that value, then x of t is converging. What should we call this? Let's call this uh, b. So this might be a, B, C. It tells me that as time goes on, I am going to move towards B. So this is as T goes to infinity. Similarly, if I started here maybe, what would happen? Well, same basic idea. If I start with that initial condition, this tells me that as time goes on, I'm moving to the right and I am also approaching B. So if I start between A and C anywhere, you can see this contraction in towards B. It says any initial condition picked between A and C is going to converge into B. You can also see that if you start too far to the right of C, you're just gonna shoot off to the end here. I don't know, I didn't draw my function far enough, so I have no idea what happens beyond there. All I know is that I'm gonna to move to the right. Same thing if I start to the left of A, all I know is that what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna keep moving to the left here. So in this case, we would call this stable. Why is it stable? If you, everything is moving in towards you if you start close enough. Same thing, we would call this unstable. No matter how close you start to C, if you don't start at it, you're going to get pushed away from it by the flow. Same thing over here. A is unstable because if you start close to A, you're always getting pushed away. Right? So B is pulling everybody in. It's like a black hole. Whereas C is pushing everybody away. Right? It's like someone who stinks in the showers.
So how do we actually do this in a modeling problem and how can we interpret these, um, these, uh, these phase line diagrams to help us with mathematical modeling? Well, I'm going to return to an example that I did in another video, which will be linked to in, this, uh, in the description to this video, okay? So the basic premise is, I have some sort of big, huge tank, and this thing has salt water in it. Okay, so this is all my salt water, and in particular, my salt water is being drained out the bottom of this thing, but new salt water is being added in the top of it. Okay, and in this case, it's going in at a rate uh, of R gallons per minute. Let me write this. So in, it's R gallons per minute. And what's coming in is a mixture of a quarter of a pound of salt per gallon of water that's going in. And what's going out? Well, the water's moving out at a rate of R gallons per minute. Okay? Now, I'm going to say let Q of T equal to the pounds of salt in the tank at time t. Okay? So if I come look at it after an hour, that would be q of say 1 if I was measuring t in hours, right? Or if I came look at it in 5 hours, that would be q of 5. So I can model this differential equation as the rate at which the amount of salt is changing is just the rate at which the salt is coming in minus the rate at which the salt is going out. Okay, so this is the change in the amount of salt. The only things that are happening in my system is salt water's coming in, salt water's draining out. We're gonna imagine that inside of my big cylinder here, my big tank, it's so mixed up and it's nice and well stirred constantly that it's a uniform distribution of salt everywhere. If I sample the salt at the bottom, it's the same as sampling at the top. Okay, it's all mixed up. So we can, we can sort of throw those complexities away. Now, as I mentioned, I derived this equation in another video. If you would like to see it, please click that link in the description. But in this case, the differential equation, the change in the amount of salt this is what's coming in, R over 4, R over 4, minus what's going out, the rate at which it's going out, the amount of salt, and in this case, it is over 100. So, now we have this equation. We also will have an initial condition. We can ask ourselves how much salt was in there, and... Then we can start analyzing this differential equation. So the first thing, like I just did on this side of the board, I can start looking at steady states. Well, steady states are when the value of Q is not changing in time. So that is when R over 4 minus RQ over 100 is equal to 0, which gives me Q is equal to 25. There is only one steady state here. And basically what it says, it's completely independent of the rate that you're flowing in and out. And what this is telling me is that if I start with initially 25 pounds of salt mixed into this water, then I am going to remain with 25 pounds of salt in there, right? It's coming in at the same rate that it's draining out. You have a perfect balance of your equation, right? Set this equal to zero. That tells me rate in is equal to rate out. The amount of salt going in is exactly the amount of salt going out. 
And the only way you can do this is if you start yourself with 25 pounds of salt in the tank. So the question is, what happens if you have different values initially? We can draw ourselves a little phase line diagram. Let's take Q. Let's put 25 on here. Label our equilibrium, the same thing that we did right here. Now, this is our function on the right-hand side of our dynamical system. What we can see is that if Q is larger than 25, this negative term dominates, and the whole derivative here is negative. That means that Q is moving to the left. So I've got all of these left arrows going like this. Same thing, if Q is smaller than 25, the negative isn't enough to pull this down, and so the rate in is really dominating. It's putting in more salt than it's taking out. And that means that the amount of salt that's being added into this thing is increasing. So we can put this all together and we can read that phase line diagram like an English sentence. Okay, so this is how I would read it as an English sentence. I would say, if I start with 25 pounds of salt, I will never change the amount of salt that is in the tank. That you have a perfect balance between rate in and rate out. Then, if I start with less than 25 pounds of salt in the tank, well then, by these flow lines, I'm going to continue increasing until I asymptotically, so as t goes to infinity, reach 25 pounds of salt. So what would that mean for me physically? You know, if I set this experiment up and say I only put 10 pounds of salt in the tank, what happens? Well, I'm, I continually add a quarter of a pound of uh, salt per gallon that's coming in. And if I left my tank and I came back in a, a long time later, depends on how I'm measuring T in this case. Well, then, what I would see is a continual increase in the salt concentration in my tank until eventually, you know, if I left this for a really, really long time, I mean, as T goes to infinity technically, then I'm approaching 25 pounds of salt in my tank. Same thing, if I start with more than 25 pounds of salt in my tank, then I am going to be draining more salt than I am adding into this thing. And that is going to pull me down. And if I leave the experiment run for a very, very long time, I will see that I will decrease the salt concentration until I wind up at that perfect balance point, that equilibrium, where the rate in is equal to the rate out. That is the beauty of a phase line diagram. All of the information about my dynamical system is right there, just in this little tiny picture. That's it, that's all that I need. Now, as we step up to more uh, or higher dimensional equations, we lose this ability to use phase line diagrams. What we'll come back with in the next lecture is how we do phase plane diagrams. That means when we have two dependent variables on time for our dynamical system. So I'll see you in the next lecture.